It is religion that causes wars. It is religion that denigrates women, that is homophobic, that condones slavery, is anti-science. It is religion that crushes diversity, that takes away personal freedom, that is deeply judgmental. And in light of that, aren't we better off without religion? Hey everybody, welcome to this brand new series that we're doing called Real Good Questions. And this is a six, six week series that's all about apologetics. That is, we are going to look at some real good questions, some real good challenges to the Christian faith. And we're going to try to answer them or respond to them in a way that we think will be helpful for all of us. Now, you may be a follower of Jesus already, and these were questions that you wrestled through, at least some of them, before you stepped over the line of faith. Or you may be a follower right now, and people have been asking you these questions, and you really haven't known how to respond to them. Or it could be that some of these challenges have been laid at your feet, and you as a follower of Jesus are maybe having some doubts about what it is that you believe. Or maybe you're a skeptic. You're not a follower of Jesus at all. You've been kicking the tires of Christianity. And perhaps this series can be one that will address some of the challenge that you have been facing and maybe draw you closer to Jesus. In other words, this series is a series that we believe will be helpful for those of us who are followers already or those of us who are skeptics and are questioning what Christianity is all about. So we're hoping that this is going to help us all as we move toward this and strengthens, and will strengthen our faith. I want to say to you that these are not foolproof answers. In other words, we're not going to convince you against your will as to what you need to believe. But we do believe that they will help us move forward, and we're really excited about that. So I want to share with you some of the challenges that are in the form of questions that we're going to be looking at over the next number of weeks. We're going to look at why would anyone trust the Bible? Another one will be, isn't Christianity anti-science? A third how can Christianity claim it's right and all other faiths are wrong? Or there's this one. Doesn't Christianity take away personal freedom? Or this one. Why does a good and powerful God allow so much suffering to take place? Those are some real good questions, and we want to dive into them. Now, today, we're going to start with a question that wasn't on that list, and I want to introduce it to you this way. So as I was growing up, I was really involved a lot of times in trying to get into conversations with people about their faith. I have dropped flyers off at literally thousands of homes. In fact, for a number of years, I literally would knock on doors and invite people into a conversation about Jesus. I remember as a, in my late teens, early 20s, hanging out at a Harvey's restaurant a number of times a, a, a month to move from car to car and talk to them about Jesus or standing outside of malls with flyers to give people a chance to hear the good news about Jesus. And over and over in those times, sometimes I would have people who would just simply walk away or close the door quietly. Sometimes I got people who were not quite very pleased with me and would express that in some ways. But sometimes I got some really good questions. And this question, the one I were going to look at this morning, was one of those questions that came up often and quite frankly, I would have had trouble answering it. I wish I knew now what I didn't know then, because I think that I could have responded a little better in answering this question, which is a very common question. And you've probably heard it stated in some form or another, and I want to dive into it today. And the question is simply this one. Aren't we better off without religion? Aren't we better off without religion? And there are a lot of people who believe that this is to be the case. If we could get rid of religion, we would be in great shape. So back in 1971, former Beatle John Lennon wrote a song. It was, his one, it, was, it was the most popular single song he had written and sung since leaving the Beatles. And you know this song, it's simply called Imagine. And in that song, Lennon chimes in on the question of the day, aren't we better off without religion? 
And if you remember some of the lines that go like this, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Ah, ha, 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 ha. The next verse goes like this. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You who, ooh, ooh, ooh. Lenin claims that no religion would enable us to live life in peace. And lots of people sing that song, and lots of people believe in those lyrics. Here's the question. Aren't we better off without religion? Now, new atheist Christopher Hitchens has a book out, a number one international bestseller, that is simply titled, God is Not Great. And I don't know if you can see this real well, but the, you'll notice the capitalization in this statement and how small God is in it. The subtitle to his book is simply this, How Religion Poisons Everything. How Religion Poisons Everything, which is a great line to tweet. What I find interesting is that Christopher's brother, Christopher has a brother whose name is Peter. And Peter Hitchens growing up in the same home, having many of the same experiences as Christopher, comes up at, in a totally different place. He was a journalist in Somalia and the so, former Soviet Union. And by watching those civilizations and the pushing out of religion, he came to this conclusion. And he says this, he says, moral behavior requires more than higher reasoning. It requires God. And Peter Hitchens wrote a book entitled the Rage Against God, subtitled How Atheism Led Me to Faith. He looks at the very issue about aren't we better off with religion, and he concludes that in fact we aren't. The question is asked, this question, aren't we better off with religion, is asked about all religions, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or Islam or Buddhism, whatever it may be. And it's saying that those religions are the reason we have so much trouble in the world. Or, or Hitchens' little line, it's religion, how religion poisons absolutely everything. And a lot of people, when you digest or dig into what they mean by this, they'll say, well, it is religion that causes wars. It is religion that denigrates women. It is religion that is homophobic. It is religion that condones slavery. It is religion that is anti-science. It is religion that crushes diversity. It is religion that takes away personal freedom. It is religion that is deeply judgmental. And in light of that, aren't we better off without religion? And let me start off by saying this because I think it's really important to start here, and that's this. Christianity is guilty of every one of these hurtful, hateful, shameful, vile actions that, it's, that often it is accused of. At one level or another, in one way or another, it has done that. And it doesn't take much to realize that that is the case. And I don't want to move quickly through this because it's really easy for me to admit something like that and then just move on without taking the time to really focus in on it. But I want to just remind us of some ways in which the label of Christianity was attached to some horrific things in history. For example, we have the Crusades, where in the name of Christianity, soldiers marched into the Holy Land and attacked Jerusalem and slaughtered Muslims in the name of Jesus. And that is an incredible blight on the history of Christianity. Or you think of the Inquisitions. Inquisitions were when uh, religious leaders would have such power over people that if they didn't believe what they believed, they would label them heretics and torture them, ban them, and murder them, all in the name of religion, in the name of Christianity. Or how about the Salem witch hunts, where people were, women were taken, innocent women were taken and, and accused of being witches, and they would be tortured and killed without mercy or justice. We can even go move quickly up into our day. We remember 9-11 and the attacks on the Twin Towers and how some um, North American preachers said the reason this happened is because of the LGBTQ community. And that's what they leveled at this event. Or how about slavery? Because there were many Christians who supported and pushed and drove for slavery. Many who fought and were deeply, deeply involved in this. And we could think of other things as well, couldn't we? It wouldn't take us very long. 
to come up with a list. There's no doubt that religion has left a bloodbath of pain and death and distrust in its wake. And because of what I've listed and other atrocities, people are asking the question, aren't we better off without religion? That's a question that's been asked of me all throughout my life. In different ways and in different forms, the accusation is there. In other words, if we removed all religion too, we would be living life in peace, you who, ooh, ooh. That's what John Lennon sang, and that's what much of the world embraces. And I want to suggest that that's not accurate. And I want to come at this question, if I can, by pointing out some reasons why. And here's the first one. We have tried it. We have tried to live with no religion too, and it has failed us miserably. If you went back to the French Revolution, there was an attempt to drive out religion from the secular world and create a utopia that didn't have any religion in it. And it ended in a bloody violence and a lot of heads rolled literally because the guillotine was used. In fact, the guillotine ultimately was used on its primary architect, Maximilien Robespierre, was one victim whose cult of reason caused the deaths of tens of thousands of people. But we can go to the Soviet Union under Stalin. We can go to China, and we can see many times when people pushed out religion that the things got incredibly bad, and many, many people died. The truth is that we don't have to imagine what it would be like to have no religion too. We can rerun the tapes of history and see what happens when you take religion out of society. Things get much worse. And it seems that when we take religion out of the mix, that something much darker and uglier comes in to fill it. It's really interesting because Richard Dawkins, who is a new age, uh, a, a young atheist, a new atheist, in one moment of kind of <laughs> magnanimity, makes this statement. He says, Christianity may be a bulwark against something worse. In other words, he's saying that Christianity may be something that stops us from experiencing worse things in our culture. I would say, are we better off without religion? And I would say no, because we've tried it, and it has failed us miserably. Let me give you a second reason, and that is this one. We have bigger problems than religion. If you look at what's going on in our world, you're going to see that there are other problems that are bigger and worse than that. One of the challenges I've heard multiple times over leveled at religion, whether it be in personal conversations or in books that I've read or articles in magazines and on the internet and so on, is that religion is the reason we have wars. I've had people tell me that every single war that's ever taken place is the result of religion. And quite frankly, that's just not an accurate statement. There is a three-volume set called the Encyclopedia of Wars. And in that, those, those volumes, they talk about 1,763 wars from 8,000 B.C. to 2004 A.D., and of those wars, these men, who are not Christians, say 123 were religious wars. Others who look at those 123 say that they're off by another by 7%. They should be 7% fewer than that. Because sometimes what they're labeling as a religious reason for a war is not, in fact, accurate. Even today, for example, we might label, some might label the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as religion when it's really about land, in fact, Andy Bannister writes in his book, The Atheist Who Didn't Exist, he says, if it were possible to magically remove all the religion from the Middle East, do you seriously believe that all the competing land claims would vanish into thin air? No, of course not. Question, aren't we better off without religion? Well, I would argue, first of all, that we've tried it and it's failed us miserably. And secondly, we have bigger problems, different problems than religion that are causing conflict in our world. I would also add this point. Blaming religion for our problems is too naive and too simplistic. So Christopher Hitchens, in his proposal, that his writing that how religion poisons everything, his, his statement to that effect, I, I think it's outside of reality. Yes, there are horrible things that have and are and will yet be done in the name of religion. But as the saying goes, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And if you look, he took his template as to why he believes religion poisons everything. 
you could apply it to a whole bunch of other areas in our world. And I want to just do that. For example, you could say that politics poisons everything. Yes, there are some, no doubt, some good things that politics does. And Hitchens would even agree that there are some good things that religion does. But look at all of the bad things that happen in the name of politics. Look at the cruel leaders and so on. I mean, if we look back at what happened in the U.S. last year um, and earlier this year, it's stunning. We, we were in a bit of shock when we realized that mobs were, were going after the Capitol building and, 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 and pushing into that, and people died as a result of that. This is in uh, the most powerful nation on the, in the world. And, and you, you say to yourself, well, that's really bad. So maybe politics poisons absolutely everything, right? You could say maybe that science poisons everything. I mean, it's absolutely true that science has done some wonderful things. Um, I love computers, my cell phone. I love watching the Mars rover. I love all of the inventions that, that science has come up with. But there's a dark side to science too, isn't there? I mean, if you look at it, science has given us thalidomide, chemical weapons, and heaps of products like plastic that are polluting our beautiful planet. Take Louis Frederick Pfizer. He was a man who was a brilliant American scientist of the 20th century. He was a chemist, and he helped develop artificial synthesis of vitamin K, necessary for blood coagulation. And it was a discovery that saved hundreds of thousands of lives. But in 1942, the U.S. Army requested his help in developing a chemical weapon that would burn tracts of jungle and eliminate troops. And so Pfizer and his colleagues at Harvard invented napalm, which is a gel that sticks to human flesh when it burns. You can jump into water and it will still keep burning. On March the 9th, 1945, 1,700 tons of napalm was dropped on Tokyo burning 84,000 human beings to death. It was dropped on other Amer Japanese cities as well. And it was also used in Vietnam where it caused terrible pain and destruction. Yes, science can be good, but it can also do harm on a brutal level. How about business? Maybe we could say that business poisons everything. Because while it does some good things, it also, it too does some things that we have huge concern over. We love the way it can provide things for us, but look at some of the questionable practices of business, such as child labor in terrible working conditions. And you think about this, and it, it has to rock you a little bit. I remember when Carol and I were in Egypt at one point, we went into a, a factory that made carpets, and there were children, 10, 11, 12 years of age, working in these factories to make these carpets. And the owner said to us, well, their funk hands are small, and their eyes are keen, and we can work them until until they get older and they're of no value anymore. And you, you hear that and your heart just weighs heavily. But when you think about our culture and you think about how much business has impacted us, this rampant consumerism which grips so many people, you have to own this car and wear this outfit and so on and so forth, there's a dark side. And when you think about how it seeps out into many areas of life, perhaps you could take that same template that's being applied to Christianity and say, well, business poisons everything. Or how about drugs? We know that prescription drugs are great, right? Because many of us wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for the meds that we're taking. But we also know that there are illegal drugs that have caused addiction and have caused all kinds of problems in people's lives. Drug lords, domination, all those things can happen. So do drugs poison everything? And we could talk about other things. We could talk about sex, for example, right? Sex is a beautiful gift from God, but when we think about child sex trafficking and sexual abuse and rape and incest and jealousy and adultery and the porn industry and even murders that are tied to it, it rocks us and we say to ourselves, well, maybe sex poisons everything. I mean, the list can go on and on, right? Yes, religion is guilty of some nasty, terrible things. But everything, it seems to me, has got this side to it that when humans get involved, it causes major problems. We have a penchant for messing things up, for taking something beautiful and using it in the wrong way. So aren't we better off without religion? Well, I would say we have tried it, and it has failed us miserably, and we have bigger or other problems than just religion in our world, and blaming religion for our problems is a little naive and a little simplistic. Christianity has brought us also many great blessings, and I want to talk about them for just a few moments here. 
there are significant global blessings because of Christianity. Christianity in particular is influenced to a great degree, if not directly, it's responsible for social welfare, founding of hospitals. It's responsible for architecture and literature and personal hygiene of all things. It's also Christianity that started the university movement and many top flight schools were started by Christians. It's launched hospitals, the modern scientific method because of a belief that there was a God that ordered everything. It launched the scientific method, human rights, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And when you take those things out of the mix, what Christianity has done, you realize the vacuum that would be in our world. In his book, Dominion, author Tom Holland does a history of, of, of the influence of Christianity. And it's profound. It's a huge, thick book um, that I read just a number of months ago. And he makes this statement. He says, so profound has been the impact of Christianity on the development of Western civilization that it has come to be hidden from view. In other words, it's been so profound that we're not even aware of how dominant it has been. Christianity has blessed our societies in many wonderful ways. There are personal blessings, right? In 2016, Harvard School of Public Health professor Tyler Vanderweel and journalist John Sinniff wrote a U.S. Today op-ed entitled, Religion May Be a Miracle Drug. And here's what they write. If one could conceive of a single elixir to improve the physical and mental health of millions of Americans at no personal cost, what value would our society place on it? And the authors go in to outline the mental and physical health benefits that are correlated with regular religious participation. So for most Americans going to church, it reduces mortality rates by 20 to 30 percent over a 15-year period. Research suggests that those who attend services are more optimistic, have lower rates of depression, and are less likely to commit suicide, have a greater purpose in life, and are less likely to divorce, and are more self-controlled. Those are pretty good benefits, right? On top of those general personal blessings, think about some of the teachings of Christianity and how they are beneficial. So Christianity teaches some things like this. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's an interesting thing that's kind of countercultural. But a growing body of research indicates that this is in fact true. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And a guy, an atheist, a social psychologist by the name of John Haidt, writes this. He says, surveys have long shown that religious believers in the United States are more happy, they're healthier, they're longer lived, and they're more generous to charity and to each other than our secular people. Religious believers give more money than secular folks to secular charities and to their neighbors. They give more of their time to and of their blood. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Bible also teaches this. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And again, this is something that's a little countercultural for our world, right? Paul says this, these words to us, and while the literature is complex, there is evidence to suggest that beyond the basic level of security, increased wealth is only slightly correlated to being happier in your life. Jeffrey Sachs, an economist, who writes in the World Happiness Report in 2018, he says this, income per capita has more than doubled since 1972, while happiness has remained roughly unchanged or has even declined. So we've increased our income believing and thinking, well, that would make us happier. But the truth is it hasn't made us happier. If anything, we've gone in, de in, in, a, in decline over that. How about gratitude? Because Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you. And he's writing this out of a context of having been shipwrecked, beaten, left for dead, abandoned by his friends. And yet what he's saying is that gratitude is actually what you need to engage in. Psychologists today have discovered that conscious daily gratitude is quite literally good for you. In experimental comparisons, those who kept gratitude journals on a weekly basis, exercised more, reported fewer physical symptoms, felt better about their lives, and were more optimistic about the upcoming week than those who recorded hassles or neutral life events. In fact, psychology professor Robert Emmons calls gratitude 
the forgotten factor in happiness research. Think about one more. So another thing the Bible teaches is that forgiveness is really important. It says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. That's part of the Lord's prayer. So the Bible's teaching that forgiveness is really, really strategic and important. And Jesus grounded our ability to forgive others in the fact that he has forgiven us, that God has forgiven us. Forgiven people must forgive. And forgiveness has been linked to multiple positive mental and physical health outcomes. And this research is just very, very clear. Those are just a few of the direct personal blessings we can know by simply following what Scripture says. So, aren't we better off without religion? Well, I would argue we've tried it, and it has failed us miserably. I would argue that we have bigger problems than religion, if you're thinking religion is the big problem in the world. I would argue that blaming religion for our problems is naive and simplistic, that Christianity has brought us many great blessings, and the problem isn't religion. The problem is people. You see, we human beings can take just about anything that's good and turn it into something that's bad. Alexander Solzhenitsyn is a a brilliant writer, but he got himself into problems with the Soviet Union um, over his political views, and so he went to prison um, and um, wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago. And I remember reading that when I was actually in my early 20s. It's a thick, it was a thick paperback book. And it would have been very easy for him to say that, that politics <laughs> poisons everything because that's the experience that he had. But instead, what he said, I think very astutely, is this. The line between good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, not between political parties either, but right through the middle of every human heart. John Gray, former professor at the London School of Economics, he's not a fan of religion, wrote this. He said, the biblical story of the fall, he doesn't believe it happened, but he says that story, teaches that evil cannot be rooted out from human life. Humans are radically flawed, a perception rooted in the doctrine of original sin. It is not error or ignorance that stands in the way of a better world. He writes, the human animal may yearn for peace and freedom, but it is no less fond of war and tyranny. No scientific advance can answer the contradictions of human needs. On the contrary, they can only be intensified as science increases human power. Now, you and I like to think about ourselves as pretty good people. And if we could draw a line and stick the bad people on one side and the good people on another side, most of us would stand on the good side and say, this is the side that I belong on. This is the side. And I would say, nice try. The truth is that if you really look at yourself, you're really a mixed bag, right? A mixed bag of, of good and bad. All too quickly, I know that's true about me. I can be cruel as well as kind, mean as well as merciful, quick to hold a grudge, and sometimes quick to forgive. Let go what some have done to me and judge others. I can be petty. I can be spiteful. I can be selfish one minute and generous the next. I can celebrate one person's success and rejoice when another person fails. And then there's my thought life. Religion can go wrong. The truth was driven home 2,000 years ago by Jesus himself because Jesus was somebody who really criticized religion. He spoke quite dramatically against the religious elite. And in fact, they hated him and they killed him. Timothy Keller writes this. He says, if you're going to criticize religion when it goes wrong, you're probably closer to Jesus on that issue than you could have ever imagined. Jesus conducts a major critique of religion in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, when he goes after religious people. And the people that he criticizes are people who pray. They're people who give to the poor. They're people who seek to live according to the Bible. But they do so in order to acclaim that they have a position and power for themselves in God's eyes. They believe it will give them leverage over God and consequently leverage over others. And Jesus even teaches that the tax collectors who were kind of outcasts for one reason and the prostitutes were outcasts for another reason. 
are actually going to enter the kingdom of heaven before the religious people will. He condemns their bigotry, their love for power, their self-righteousness, their legalism, their judgmentalism. And he tells them they neglect the justice and of God and they do not love God. It's interesting that Karl Barth, a Swiss theologian, writes these words, it was the church, or you could substitute the word religion, it was the church and not the world who ultimately crucified Jesus. It was those religious, religious leaders. So listen to Jesus speak to the religious people. Here's what we read in Luke chapter 11, verses 39 to 46. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside also make the inside? Woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you're like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. There's a tendency for religious people to use religious rites and rituals that they believe they've achieved to help them believe they're in a right relationship with God because of what they do, and therefore they look down on anyone else who doesn't perform like they do. And they've missed the whole of the gospel. Because the gospel isn't about me doing something to gain merit with God so I can look down on others. It's all of grace. I can't do anything. I need God's grace and God's mercy and his love. That's what God extends to us. I need to repent. I need to identify who I am. And I need to see God for who he is. The church has been guilty of oppressing others. But ironically, the reason we think it's been oppressing others is because the Bible gives us the standards or the tools to evaluate whether we're oppressing others. It is the book that Christians follow. Any deviation from what is supposed to be is a deviation from the very instructions given to the church in Scripture itself. So the strongest critics of Christianity are using the book Christianity claims to follow against her, and rightly so. Historian John C. Somerville argues that when the Anglo-Saxons first heard the gospel, they were stunned by the message that called on people to love their enemies and serve others and so on. They couldn't understand how a culture could survive if it lived that out. And so they segregated what scripture called on them to do, what Christianity at its core teaches with their their deep-seated belief in honor and power. And it was because of this that they went and fought in the Crusades, all the while calling themselves Christians. And they believed the monks and the women and the children could live the life that, that the scriptures described they should live. They didn't live out the teachings of Jesus, but made a show as if they did. So how do we then live? To abandon Christianity and throw it in the trash heap of failed movements? That's what some would do. But if you do that, you're actually throwing out what isn't Christianity. And we need to get back to what it's really all about. Historically, there are examples of Christian, where Christianity has been a voice for self-correction. I think of slavery, for example. Slavery happened in countries with strong Christian influence, no doubt. And some Christians supported it, sadly practiced it. Slavery was generally universal throughout the early centuries. Yet it was Christians who first came to the conclusion that it was wrong. Social historian Rodney Stark writes these words. He says, although it has been fashionable to deny it, anti-slavery doctrines began to appear in Christian theology soon after the decline of Rome and were accompanied by the eventual disappearance of slavery in all but the fringes of Christian Europe. When Europeans subsequently instituted slavery in the New World, they did so over strenuous papal opposition, a fact that was conveniently lost from history until recently. Finally, the abolition of New World slavery was initiated and achieved by Christian activists. Now, Christians began to fight against slavery because they believed primarily that it was against the will of God. 
So men such as William Wilberforce in, in, in England were fighting desperately, politically, to get the people to change. Slavery was so lucrative that it was hard to fight against it. But people in the British colonies told the British House of Commons that if they abandoned slavery, the price of everything would skyrocket and things would collapse economically. But this did not deter the abolitionists. And they agreed to compensate the planters for all free slaves. Now think about that. They're going to give them money to free the slaves. It was an astounding sum of up to half the British government's annual budget to do that. The Act of Emancipation passed in 1893, and the costs were so high to the British people that one historian called the British abolition of slavery voluntary econocide, okay? Historian Howard Temperley writes that the history of abolition is puzzling because most historians believe that all political behavior is driven by self-interest. Yet despite the fact that hundreds of scholars over the last 50 years have looked for ways to explain it, Temperley says, no one succeeded in showing that those who campaigned for the end of the slave trade stood to gain in any tangible way or that these measures were other than economically costly to the country. Slavery was abolished because it was wrong. That was what God was telling them. We could think about racism, we could think about Martin Luther King and how that he fought against racism, another Christian leader. One of his favorite verses was from Amos 5.24, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. It was the Bible that drove his mission. It was Jesus that called on him to do this. And he loved, as I mentioned, to quote Amos. Now listen, we've gone through a lot of stuff and we've gone through it quickly. And what we've been trying to do is answer this question, aren't we better off without religion? And we've said, you know what? We have tried it and it has failed us miserably. And we talked about the fact that we've got bigger problems than religion. We said blaming religion for our problems is naive and simplistic. Christianity has brought us many great blessings. The problem isn't religion. The problem is people. Now, there's no doubt, as I mentioned earlier, that Christianity is guilty of every one of those hurtful, hateful, shameful, vile actions that I listed earlier, and we could go on with a long list in the name of, of Christianity. But I want to continue my statement here and write this. But Jesus is not guilty because Jesus did not do that. Jesus was different, and the core of Christianity is different. The truth that the Bible teaches is different. And it is a message of love and grace and peace and joy. It's the message that brings us into a right relationship with God, and it comes by recognizing how separate we are from God. Talked about that line, which side we'd stand on. Putting our faith in Jesus is really the answer to that. He is our hero. He is the one we follow. He is the one who stands up for this truth, who lived it out in so many ways. You need to look to him and find the truth of how to live in Jesus, not in religion, not in a bunch of rules and rites and rituals and regulations, but in a person named Jesus. And when you look at him, you will, as Pilate said, find no fault in him and find the way to live a life that's fulfilled and free and right with God. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we've run through a lot of stuff today. We've looked at a lot of different things. But I know that that question about religion being the problem in the world, the religion poison everything, has been something that many people have heard and embraced, and it has kept them away from you or caused doubts in the minds of followers. And I pray that we would have raised today some opposition to that position, and that people would slow down and think through and see in the midst of all of it, Jesus. For he is the one who modeled it all. He is the son of God. We want to follow him and embrace him and love him. And I thank you for him, a light in the midst of this darkness. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.